So I'm absolutely delighted to be joined next by Martin Butcher. Martin is a Green Councillor and also the former author of the NATO Monitor blog. And we're going to be talking about the Green Party's new policy on NATO. Can you explain to our viewers what your major criticisms of NATO are? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, to start with, it's a massive military bloc that consumes enormous resources and does so really inefficiently. Um, and in being that, it's an impediment to progress in security policy. So you go all the way back to the 1990s when I was living in Brussels and you know, working very actively on NATO issues. Um, the Cold War finished, people thought NATO would wind up. Certainly people in NATO HQ back in 1990 and 91 were absolutely panicking. They were all gonna be out of a job. It was quite remarkable. Um, and we had the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, the OSCE, as a more human security based organization that, that um, certainly I worked to try and promote and people thought could, could take over from military blocs in Europe as, as disarmament happened that decade. But NATO stood in the way of that. There was a lot of, um, momentum behind its existence, you know, 40 years at the time of existence, and the lack of trust that the continuation of that, that military bloc signaled meant that initiatives like the NATO Russia Council or um, OSCE drives to, to create a system based on indivisible security for all states just never got off the ground. And finally, it's a, you know, the, the, the way the, the military looks at security as a zero is as a zero sum game. You know, if I've got security, then it doesn't matter whether you've got it. And indeed, if you think you can't have it because I've got military security, that doesn't matter to me because I feel safe. But in the long term, it's not a good way to 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 look at the world. So you finished there by saying that it's not a good way to look at the world. Now, the Green Party of England and Wales at its recent spring conference uh, passed a new policy on NATO. So historically, the Greens position was that the UK should withdraw from that military alliance. The new position is slightly more nuanced. So the, 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 the policy that was passed at spring conference in Birmingham says that uh, the Greens would like to see the UK remain a member of NATO and push for a series of reforms of, of it, uh, calling for NATO to, um, uh, to introduce a commitment to a no nuclear weapon first use policy, to um, ensure it upholds human rights in its operations, to only act in the, in the defence of its member states, and so on and so on and so on. Uh, now, you have said that you think that those reforms, that position is unrealistic. Why do you think so? Um, I think it's really important to base policy, all policy, in a, a careful study of what it is we're trying to reform. And I think you know, if we look at you know, good housing policy, you know, environmentally friendly housing, if we look at transport policy, absolutely Green Party policy is, is based in realistic assessments of what needs to be done and the step that needs to, steps that need to be taken to get to where we want to be. It often feels like the, the Green Party and, and, and the left in general um, in the UK doesn't look at an organization like NATO in the same way. It looks at it and thinks big military block, that's bad, want to be against it. As you say, the new policy is a bit more nuanced, but um, I, mean, I, I have heard people saying that, you know, there were some good ideas on one side of the debate, some ideas on the other side of the debate, they weren't necessarily able to be reconciled. So you sort of put a bit of both in and, and it makes for a declaratory policy that I don't particularly disagree with in most of the bits of, um, but it, it, it doesn't really feel like a realistic policy for actually what's happening in the world. I mean, it clearly, um, you know, we've seen German Greens going in a big way 
um, towards um, you know, military supplies to Ukraine and, and reinforcing defense because of what's happening in Ukraine. Um, and I under absolutely understand that. Um, but I mean, the problem is NATO isn't something you can treat as just a homogenous organization that, that acts on its own. It's the sum of its member states. And you need to look at what all the member states think, what the bigger member states are doing, what the smaller member states are doing, how that organization has changed because of that over the years. Um, and I, I, I don't think that, that, that our analysis does that terribly well. I mean, I will say I was I was pleased that the, 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 um, the paragraph on new on the missile defense didn't get deleted because I think that's really important. And I think people don't necessarily understand very well um, the offensive role of missile defense, you know, its potential for shooting down satellite satellites, its potential for shooting down um uh you know, knocking out other other systems which then allow the side that possesses possesses missile for defense to carry out its own offensive operations it's an integral in, integral part of the first strike capability um in nuclear terms so i i think it's to, to me there's something of an understanding lacking in the 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 policy as a whole it all feels a bit sort of cobbled together in terms of that understanding, I guess the the, the party's defence policies, you know, still support and endorse uh, nuclear disarmament and yet are now saying they want to maintain membership of NATO, which is fundamentally a nuclear alliance. How, what do you see as the incongruence there between those two positions? Well, I think it, it's really basically that um, while you know, no first use of nuclear weapons is absolutely a policy, you know, I would support, have campaigned for, um, while, you know, other ideas like, you know, denuclearizing NATO as a whole, again, it's, you know, this is work I've tried to do over the years. It's, it's fundamentally unrealistic to think that NATO is going to go down this path. I mean, the first thing is, again, NATO's nuclear policy is driven by its member states and in this case by the United States and every time the United States does a nuclear posture review that policy then becomes NATO policy it it just happens if it, it follows people follow it because the US is you know the by far the largest nuclear state in NATO and they they decide things like that um, so you know, where where we're, we're in a situation now where the Biden administration has done its nuclear posture review, it's rejected no first use, it's rejected an idea um, that was knocked around during the Obama years and since about declaring that nuclear weapons only exist to de deter other nuclear weapons, play no other role. Um, and indeed, it's bringing more nuclear weapons back into Europe, they're, they're very likely to return to Lake and Heath after a 20 year absence. Um, and the, the nuclear sharing policy, um, where, which I wrote several papers on in the 90s and early noughties, tried very, very, very hard to get NATO states to accept that it was a breach of the non-proliferation treaty. Um, that's been strengthened, it's been widened to bring in cooperation of more member states and now we're seeing it mirrored between you know Russia and Belarus so um sadly I was at the at the Pentagon in 1998 when the German defense minister came to tell the United States that nuclear weapons had to go from Germany and the nuclear policy had to change and he went into the meeting really confident very sure of his talking points um telling the media what was going to happen in the meeting and he came out and stood there and said that he now understood that these things were very hard and that um, maybe there were factors that he hadn't considered and, and things would take time. And that in the meantime, NATO would have a review of disarmament issues to see what might be possible. 
So, you know, the, the, the block is not in Brussels on these things. The block is in Washington. So that's where you have to have to persuade change. And I think that's not reflected in the policy. So what do we do? Are, are we therefore not going to go in, into NATO because this change is not imminent? Or are we going to go into NATO and be sucked into nuclear defence as well? So I want to move on to one of the things that you mentioned earlier, which was Ukraine. And I think the context in which the Green Party's policy was rewritten is obviously in the aftermath of uh, Putin's invasion of Ukraine. And I think for quite a lot of people on the left, that's that's challenged their views on NATO and its role in world affairs. Um, do you think the left needs to reevaluate its position on NATO in any way following uh, Russia's invasion? I think it's absolutely reasonable to look for um, ways of helping the Ukraine to defend itself. I mean, Ukraine is a, you know, it's a sovereign state. It has the right of self-defense set out in the UN Charter. Supplying weapons to allow it to do that um, in the way that's been done seems to me to be absolutely reasonable. So in that sense, yes, I mean, I think the we need to recognize that um, you know, in instances like this, the world is as it is, not as we would like it to be. And, and uh, self-defense um, is a reasonable thing to strive for. Um, I think there is some over-egging of the pudding, as it were. And if we, we look at NATO as a whole, um, it has somewhere between two and a half and four to one advantage in conventional forces over, over Russia. And we've seen in Ukraine just how abysmally Russia's forces have, have performed militarily and how you know, bad their equipment is when you know, assessments prior to the war um, might have assumed that a large Russian force would just walk through a much smaller country. Um, so I, I think there's maybe too much stress in, oh, my goodness, we have to build up military forces. We have to spend more on the military. Um, I think we could certainly coordinate more on the military. European countries spend a lot of money very, very inefficiently matching capabilities that they don't need to match. And, and you could probably spend less and get more for their money if they coordinated better. Um, you know, the UK also. You know, we, we look at um, procurement in the MOD and it's you know, nobody's happy with it. Even, even the most militaristic Tories think it's appalling and needs to be done better. Um, so I, I think they, those two sides of the coin need to be need to be looked at at the same time. But it's definitely it's refocusing NATO um, back into its core mission of, of defense of its members and away from the sort of out of area or out of business attitude that took over in the 90s and saw you know terrible episodes in um, you know ac across the world and so some of the things that you've been saying have been similar to some of the things that um lindsay german who i interviewed on the last episode from stop the war coalition said but you have been critical of stop the war's position on nato and lindsay's position as well um, where are the points that you disagree with them? Well, I think I mean, coming back to where we began, I think, you know, Stop the War has a tendency to throw out slogans rather than to think about what it's saying. Um, I think that's unfortunate. You know, I, I come from a background. I, I worked for CND for, for several years in the 80s. I was on CND's National Executive Committee. So, you know, I'm not unsympathetic to that campaigning background at all. Um, but... You know, when when uh, you know, she says things like NATO is an offensive alliance and stop the war campaigns on that. Um, I think, again, we have to get back to this question of looking at the difference between the organization with the headquarters in Brussels and its member states. Um, you know, the, the 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 invasion of Iraq did not happen because NATO wanted to invade Iraq. It happened because the United States wanted to invade Iraq and after the, it, it persuaded in a coalition of the willing a, a few states to come along with it, notably the UK. And then afterwards, 
it persuaded other NATO members to try and mop up its mess. Um, the same was very much true in Afghanistan. You know, NATO was not involved in the initial overthrow of the, the Taliban government after 9-11, but became involved once NATO had, had come in, um, put Karzai in power and essentially demolished the government structures. So NATO was again used as a way to bring to bring other states in. Um, so I don't think it's necessarily fair to say that, that, that the alliance is inherently an offensive alliance. I don't think it's um, and I don't think it's helpful as, as, as a way of campaigning. I mean, other issues that you know, NATO has been blamed for for the, the war in Libya um, around the overthrow of Gaddafi. But again, you know, that was very much driven by France, Italy, with the UK tagging along and then dragging America into it. It was a French Italian thing that, as much as anything, um, was about um, changing the, trying to change the relationship between um, uh, the south, southern and northern Mediterranean and, and stop flows of migrants. Now, obviously, that failed dramatically, and it failed dramatically because the Libyan state was systematically bombed out of existence by countries which belonged to NATO but were not acting as NATO. Um, so, uh, I mean, that's that's again, it comes back to we we need to to study NATO. We need to and defense as a whole. And we need, we need to um, understand thoroughly what we're talking about in order to be part of a, um, a realistic debate about how to reform the UK's role in that alliance. And so while I've got you, uh, it's, 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 it's linked, but it's not directly related to the Green Party's position. But um, given your expertise in this area, I think it'd be interesting for our viewers to hear. Obviously, in the last a few days there's been quite significant news in terms of NATO and its membership with with Finland um joining and it looks like NATO is going to be expanding its membership more um yeah. what's your what's your reflection on the the changing shape of NATO uh, sort of I guess post the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine yeah I mean I I understand why Finland might want to do that now um and it's been years and years and years this has been discussed in Finland um, and I, I actually, I, I went to Finland back in about 97, 98, I forget exactly, to debate the Finnish defence minister about whether it was a good idea to join. And I was there, you know, the, the anti-nuclear movement expert who was you know, basically saying it was a bad idea, only to discover that she thought it was a worse idea than I did. <laughs> <laughs> that threw me a bit but you know um so clearly circumstances have changed very much for finland and you know within living memory they have been invaded by russia uh, and had land taken off them um sweden's in a bit of a different situation sweden throughout the cold war although neutral in a sense integrated its defense very very thoroughly with nato planning um so it, it's less of a surprise that they might want to. I, 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 the, the enlargement of NATO is not in any way an excuse for Russia to do what it has done in Ukraine. It just isn't. But 20 to 30 years ago, lots of people in government as well as in civil society like me were saying, that if we wanted to have a long-term sustainable peace in Europe, we had to take account of the security thinking of all European states, inside or outside NATO, and not do things that would um, lead to a deterioration of what looked at the time, you know, the beginning of the 90s, as if it might be a more peaceful world. And Unfortunately, the momentum was with NATO, the enlargements began to happen. I mean, reluctantly, it must be said, you know, I remember again very well being sat at NATO headquarters um, and told by a 
a very senior British politi political figure in an off the record briefing, that the partnership for peace that NATO invented in the mid 90s um, was not a stepping stone into NATO, but was rather like the visitor's room in a gentleman's club that, that Hungary and Poland would be allowed to sit in the visitor's room, but there was no way they would ever be allowed to become members. That didn't happen. Had that happened, it, you know, had, had that process been followed in that way, it might have been better and we might be in a better situation now. But back at the time, 20 something years ago, bad decisions were taken um, and you know, the, the Russians began to feel pushed into a corner. And with the, the way politics has deteriorated there into authoritarianism, you know, we're now at the end of that process and you know, they bear responsibility for what they've done. But um, at, the at the same time, um, you know, we could to take the words of the OSCE again, have looked at security as an individual, an indivisible thing for, for all countries in Europe and, and proceeded on that basis, not on a zero sum game basis. Fine. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much, Chris.